Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our 17th lecture as we have been going through the doctrine of God and the Trinity through the early church fathers. And tonight we are getting to who you probably have all been expecting, anticipating, just couldn't wait to get to, is Augustine. He is the theologian of theologians. Um, now, I better be careful because I might set myself up for failure if you're expecting this amazing presentation about Augustine and I just kind of kind of tank it. So, all that to say, please, there's so much to cover about him. I'll be having two lectures um, by Guinness, a brilliant, brilliant thinker. I mean, to much of the Western world, uh, he really has no rival. He is the preeminent, uninspired theologian of the Christian faith. When you read the titans of the church, such as Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, many others, Augustine's theology and ideas are voluminously parroted all throughout their writings. I think Calvin, I think Calvin cites Augustine like seven thousand times. I, I think I could be completely wrong. But I kept thinking it was like something about that amount. I mean, these guys are just re-saying what he's saying in their own kind of dogmatic context. So. But again, as I said, his, his influence is unparalleled. And even the secular world sees Augustine as a mammoth figure in the shaping of human history, especially the West. So um, we're going to get into it. Like I said, get two two parter on this one. But uh, a quick, brief background Augustine of Hippo lived from 354 to 430. He rose in the church to become the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. And through his written works, had a profound impact upon the development of theology, of the, especially in the medieval and the Reformation eras. And obviously, he's pivotal in his time. I mean, the doctrine of the Trinity that he pretty much arrived at, again, standing on those be, before him, but kind of taking a step further, um, that's really the doctrine of the Trinity that the West holds to today. Um, his early days, and especially his spiritual pilgrimage, were delineated in the autobiographical work uh, Confessions. Now, Confessions is a it's a classic text. It's one of the first of its kind of hearing an, an ancient author really, again, go through. It's like a diary of, of his spiritual pilgrimage, as I, as I noted. So definitely, definitely want to read that. Um, but he was born in Tagaste near Carthage to a pagan father and a devout Christian mother. Monica is her name. Augustine lost his faith in his teens as he sought fame as a teacher of rhetoric. This began a search for truth in various philosophical systems, finally leading to what is called Manichaeism or Manichaeism. It's a, a radical Gnostic sect which held to a, a cosmic dualism to that saw two, you know basically saw evil and light, you know, or, or darkness and light as two opposing forces that were in constant cosmic conflict, hence the name cosmic dualism. Uh, if you recall, I went through Ambrose and the, it was his sermons. Ambrose's sermons that led to the conversion of Augustine in 386. Augustine's return to Africa began a rapid rise to prominence in the church. As Bishop of Hippo, uh, his intellectual gifts and his rhetorical skills were put in service to the church in dealing with the Donatist and Pelagian controversies in the writing key works, including The City of God, which is a treatise on church and state. It's a mammoth work. I'm actually taking... Some guys uh, at church through uh, at church through it right now. It's been uh, I think we're about nine months into it. Um, it's a 1,100 page book uh, on the Trinity, which is the classic text on the doctrine of the Trinity, and on Christian doctrine, a primer on the interpretation of Scripture. And also he's written many commentaries. So again, there's many many works out there still. I think I believe there's many works of his that are still in Latin that are not translated into English. But our study for tonight will proceed through an exposition of his most well-known work, City of God, uh, Confessions and His Letters, and then Augustine's dogmatic account of the Trinity will conclude our study. It's really a sophisticated book. Um, it spent He spent many years, I think 20 years, writing it. Um, but it is the confession of the Christian faith when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity. So... All right, well, we're going to get started here. So the, the immutable essence of God is where we will start. Augustine uh, really kind of goes through this in his confessions in City of God, and, and, and it's really, really just um, just marvelous how he writes these things. So it is, it is 
a classical work. So Augustine's doctrine of God is classical through and through. He writes, quote, There is one invisible from whom, as the creator and first cause, all things seen by us derive their, be- their being. He is supreme, eternal, unchangeable, and com- incomprehensible by none except himself alone. Well, incomprehensible by none, save himself alone. Excuse me, I kind of paraphrase that one. But when reading his works, the doctrine of mutability is paramount, coming forth repeatedly. In his confessions, Augustine begins his work, his very first sentence with extolling the Creator. The Lord of heaven and earth, with inscrutable wisdom, Augustine asks, if any praise is worthy of his majesty. Oh, I didn't do that slide. Well, all right. He speaks of the unfathomable divine essence that is everywhere present, of which heaven and earth cannot contain him. Rather, you contain all things in yourself and fill them by the reason, by reason of the very fact that you contain them. However, the ineffable Lord has condescended to accept the worship of men's mouths and has desired us through the medium of our own words to rejoice in his praise. That's a great sentence. That's from... Um, his on Christian doctrine. Augustine is awestruck in contemplating the presence of God in his creation. He ponders, are you present to all things and are you present in all things at once? He asks, what then is the God I worship? He can be none but the Lord God himself, for who but the Lord is God? What other refuge can there be except out God? <coughs> Our God, excuse me. Augustine's conception of God is directly tied to the revelation of God as Lord and refuge in the biblical texts. He understands that the declarative statements regarding God's divine acts for his creatures lead him to conclude the Lord God must be supreme, utmost in goodness, mightiest and all-powerful, most merciful and most just. For Augustine, immutability or his unchangeableness is consequential of divinity. Creatures are immutable. The nature which is immutable is called creator. As the unchangeable one, he changes all. He is never new, never old, and yet all things have life from him. As the unchangeable one, he is ever active, yet always at rest. And while he gathers all things to himself, he is never in need of them. Rather, he desires to nourish his creatures and bring them to perfection. Augustine does not see an inconsistency in saying God is unchangeable and loves his creatures, yet can be angry with them. In God's working and in his resting, Augustine says, he is not affected. He is affected by something. If he's, I'm sorry, if he is affected by something, then it implies that there comes to be something in his nature which was not there before, because whatever is acted upon is changeable. That's a it's a important phrase there. Whatever is acted upon is changeable. And because he is unchangeable and the source of all good, his goodness is never idle. He did not awaken from an inactivity in eternity past to create. Rather, by one and the same eternal and unchangeable will, he effected regarding the things he created, both that formerly, so long as they were not, they should not be, and that subsequently, when they became to be, they should come into existence. Time is a creature. Thus God is not bound by it, for he is himself eternal and without beginning, yet he caused time to have a beginning, having made man in time according to his unchangeable and eternal design. God's infinity for him means for him today never comes to an end, and yet our today does come to an end in you because time, as well as everything else, exists in you. If it did not, it would have no means of passing, and since your years never come to an end for you, they are simply today. Now, somewhere else he says something about time. is It's a strange thing. He knows what it is, but we don't know what it is. And I forget where he says that. I wish I would have included that in here somewhere. But it's definitely time is a strange thing. As already mentioned in the introduction of this work, 
um, our lecture, excuse me. Remember, I'm, I'm taking a book and I'm making it to lecture form. So sometimes I say work because uh, I'm, you know, it's in that book form. So anyways, prior to Augustine's conversion, he was a Manichaean. The Manichaean's ontological conception of God did not bifurcate between created and uncreated being. Augustine thought God was a material thing, entirely physical. He struggled to formulate a conception of God that was real, but distinct from the material world. While he knew God could not have a bodily shape, he could not free himself from thinking that God were some kind of bodily substance extended in space, either permeating the world or diffused in infinity beyond it. However, his philosophical intuition understood that bodies change and decay. And if God had a body, it means he is inferior because bodies decay. God is free from corruption, mutation, any degree of change. So it was not until he came to understand the platonic concept of a spiritual substance that his eyes were open to the unseen, uncreated metaphysical reality in every part. <clears throat> I'm sorry, skip the sentence. Uh, metaphysical reality in which all things live and move and have their being. What Bible passage is that? If you don't know, it's Acts 17.28. At one time, Augustine did not know that God is a spirit, a being, without bulk and without limbs defined in length and breadth, encompassing creation on all sides and penetrating it in every part, yet yourself infinite in every dimension. But his reading of the Platonists prompted him to look for truth as something incorporeal. Having caught sight of your invisible nature, as it is known through your creatures, Paul's words finally became clear to Augustine. It is through creation, as the Apostle Paul writes, that we can catch sight of the truth. This eternal truth, true love, beloved eternity, all this, my God, you are. Augustine can now grasp that God is spirit, unchangeable, incorporeal, present in his whole being everywhere. Augustine's affirmation of God as creator of all things posed a problem regarding the existence of evil. We're not going to get uh, into that problem of evil here. <clears throat> he says, how could God create evil since he is not only good, but goodness itself? That's in line with what? Divine simplicity. While he contemplated deep and wide on such matters, Augustine could not traverse the gulf of the divine essence. Regardless of the impasse at which he arrived, Augustine's starting point in contemplating God is that the divine nature was incorruptible, supreme, the perfect good. We see Augustine's assumption of God's perfections as being the divine essence and that God's nature is insufferable because it cannot be compelled to change by anything against his will because the will and power of God are God himself. Again, we hear more of divine simplicity. Scripture reveals the otherness of God's essence from created being. As Augustine saw God's substance as the light that never changes, casting its rays over the same eye of my soul, over my mind. It was above me because it was light I'm sorry, it was above me because it was itself the light that made me, and I was below because I was made by it. I love that saying. I think it's actually the saying I have in the very first slide of Augustine, although I went through it too fast. Citing James 1.17 as the father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows, his knowledge does not differ from that which is ever, was nor shall be, because variations in creaturely reality, that of time, past, present, and future, do not affect his knowledge as they do us. God's unchangeability or immutability entails that his knowledge is not derived through transition of thought, but beholds all things with absolute unchangeableness. As perfect beings, so you alone have perfect knowledge. For all things which he knows are at once embraced. For as without any movement that time can measure, he himself moves all temporal things, so he knows all times with a knowledge that time cannot measure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Augustine posits 
that that which is in time is a lower order than God's absolute being, which he signifies as real being. In case you didn't hear me right, I said real being, not real, (laughs) B-E-A-N, real being. He writes, they are real insofar as they have their being from you, but unreal in the sense that they are not what you are, for it is only that which remains in being without change that truly is. And he references Exodus 3.14. God's perfect being knows and wills unchangeably, and your will is and knows unchangeably. And the one who truly is can never change because you alone are absolute simplicity. For whom to live is the same as to live in blessed happiness, since you are your own beatitude. I love that. So he actually here states the word absolute, I'm sorry, the phrase absolute simplicity. Right? He sees that what God is or what he has is what he is. So the happiness in God is in God because happiness, or he is happiness. Now, it's funny. People say you can't say happiness is God because that inverts that, that ratio. You, you can never say the, the um, um, attribute is God. You say God is the attribute. Although, somewhere else, Augustine says God is love and love is God. But, again, a lot of modern systematic guys would have a problem with Augustine saying that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, for Augustine... The fact that the earth and the heavens exist demonstrates they were created. They are subject to change and variation in that there was nothing before, and the meaning of change and variation is that something is there which was not there before. It's a very simple logic. Created substance we know is not eternal. Matter is not eternal. And the fact that it is there, the physical reality, and that it changes, then we know that there was a time when it was not. So how did these things get there, Augustine asks. Because nothing exists apart from God, it must be that you spoke and they were made. In your word alone you created them, and God's speech was expressed through the motion of some created thing. Augustine intimates an, incar- an, an, no, Augustine intimates an incomparable difference between divine speech and human speech in that human words are sound in time, are spoken, are heard, die away and are lost, whereas the word is silent, uttered eternally, and uttered at one and the same time. So the whole point is that we don't hear the word speak, but it's uttered eternally and uttered at once in the same time. So we speak words and they just kind of come out and they go away. God speaks words and it continues to sustain all things by what? The word of his power from Hebrews 1.3. The eternal utterance of the word entails immutability. Otherwise, it would not be truly eternal nor truly immortal. And mutability belongs to all things that are subject to change. Augustine addresses the question that asks if God is eternal and the will of God is part of his substance. And creation is a product of the divine will. Why isn't creation likewise eternal? Such questions or objections arise due to a lack of understanding of immutability. Such people err because their thoughts still twist and turn upon the ebb and flow of things in past and future time. They need to revel in the splendor of eternity, as Augustine says, seeing that time, in contrast to eternity, derives its length only from a great number of movements constantly following one another into the past because they cannot all continue at once. However, in eternity, nothing moves into the past All is present. Time, on the other hand, is never all present at once. Augustine reflects further on time and eternity, purposing to quell misconceptions about God's relation to time. Because our language is couched in creaturely notions, our expressions always come forth in relation to time, then, when, before, after, etc. And all expressions are notions of change. But God is unchanging your years never change. 
God cannot be considered idle before creation, as many object regarding immutability, because there was no time, thus there was no then. God's years are present all at once in a permanent standstill. Augustine continues his line of thought to demonstrate the eternality of the sun. He writes, Your years are one day, yet your day does not come daily, but is always today. Because your today does not give place to any tomorrow, nor does it take place of any yesterday. Your today is eternity. And this is how the Son, to whom you said, I have begotten you this day, was begotten co-eternal with yourself. You can see why I posted that instead of me just reading it and you guys trying to figure that out. You know, he's got a way with, he has a, a way with how he turns phrases. Creatio ex nihilo, to use the term anachronistically, is the creation doctrine imbibed from Augustine's ontological framework. Because he is before all things, again speaking of God, not Augustine, because he is before all things and is not subject to change, when God is said to have made something in the beginning, this something, Augustine writes, is of yourself in your wisdom, which is born out of your own substance, and you created this out of nothing. But when Augustine says creation was of God's own substance, he does not mean that the heavens and the earth were made out of your own substance. There was nothing apart from God that God used to bring the world into existence. Otherwise, he would be a craftsman, not a creator. Rather, Augustine writes, God created from matter, which you created at one and the same time as the things that you made from it, since there was no interval of time before you gave form to this formless matter. And Augustine offers a formulaic expression of the simple Trinitarian essence of God to support his argument. He writes, But besides yourself, O God, who are Trinity in unity, in unity in Trinity, there was nothing from which you could make heaven and earth. For Augustine, creation and the works of God are very good because it is you who see them in us and it was you who have given us the spirit by which we see them and love you in them. In our brief survey of Augustine's views on the essence and attributes of God, it is strikingly obvious that divine immutability occupies the chief place in Augustine's theology. So why is it such a powerful driving force for Augustine? Well, Simply put, peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace. Augustine can only find rest in peace in the eternal God. He writes, For when the saying of Scripture comes true, and death is swallowed up in victory, who shall stand with us? You truly are the eternal God, because in you there is no change, and in you we find the rest that banishes all our labor. Now, while Platonic thought gave shape to his understanding of spiritual substance, script, Scripture made such claims to begin with of God's unchanging essence. Platonic thought provided a divine grammar and conceptual tool, but it stopped short of revealing the triune God. Augustine writes, Believing that my God is a trinity provided him the lens to see him as the personal creator, in the scriptural witness of the Trinity's divine acts in time and space. And therefore, when he searched for this truth in the sacred words, and found where it says that your spirit moved over the waters, here then is the Trinity, my God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the creator of all creation. <clears throat> now, it is time to transition into Augustine's theology of the Trinity which will take the rest of our time today in the next week's lecture. So, Augustine's work, De Trinitate, uh, is a mammoth work on the Trinity. He wrote it over an extended period of about 20 years. And so in this book, he primarily focuses on how humanity is able to perceive and understand the Trinity, developing a series of analogies that rely on scripture and philosophy. So in our lecture, ultimately there are um, the, the Trinity is, is divided up into 14 books. We're going to go through books 1 through 8. Um, the remaining books, which would be 9 through 14, they make up Augustine's constructive psychological or mental image of the Trinity. Though very profound and instructive, trying to cover that 
material here would kind of really detract from what I'm trying to do in this book, work, I keep saying, right, work. Um, but I'm just going to cite here Edmund Hill, who's the translator and wrote the introduction and all the fours and notes in his edition. <clears throat> he says this, regarding these books. In the dogmatic sense, Augustine's doctrine about the divine processions has already been given in books 1 through 8. So again, I think sticking with these books and not spreading it out into those is, is more helpful. I very much so recommend reading it. But again, for what I'm trying to do here, I decided to leave it out. So the remaining books are Augustine's investigation of the processions of the person seen through a mental conceptualization of memory, understanding, and will in the human mind that appropriates to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Um, uh, Thomas Aquinas did take this analogy, and from what you know, a lot of people say that he kind of perfected it. So I'll probably get to that when we get to Aquinas much later. Okay. So book one. <clears throat> in the beginning chapter of De Trinitate... Augustine begins with expressing the equality of the divine persons. Now, key to his doctrine of God is the notion of God's eternality and immutability and that he who is without any change in himself makes things that change and without any passage of time in himself creates things that exist in time. And the unchangeable eternal divine essence is shared by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The essence of the triunity of God is equally a unity. Augustine confesses this truth from those before him who have derived this understanding from the scriptures which teach that Father and Son and Holy Spirit in the inseparable equality of the one substance present a divine unity and therefore there are not three gods but one God. An express article of the faith Augustine's, sorry, and as an express article of the faith, Augustine offers the formulaic idiom of the distinction of the persons. He says, The Father has begotten the Son, and therefore he who is the Father is not the Son, and the Son is begotten by the Father, and therefore he who is the Son is not the Father. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Holy Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son, but only the Spirit of the Father and of the Son himself co-equal to the Father and the Son, and belonging to the threefold unity. Retaining the threefold unity, Augustine offers a few passages from Scripture demonstrating the divine acts of the triune God bring about creaturely effects that terminate in the individual persons properly or distinctly. But real quick, um, just that quote I have here on the slide, um, it may sound kind of, I don't know, maybe what's the word, pedantic to really be um, precise, but we have to remember the precision is important because we say that within the triunity of God are three distinct persons. Now, their essence isn't distinct. They share the one essence, but they are not separate um, centers of consciousness. They are not human beings as we are, whereas my wife and my daughter and I, we are three persons, but we are truly distinct from each other. Right? We don't share thought, we don't share blood, we don't share our intestinal tracts. Right? We are distinct beings, though we are humans. The divine being, though made of three persons, they're not distinct, separate, tripartite beings in the Godhead. Otherwise, we'd have three gods. Um, then I did say a phrase about um, the passages in Scripture that demonstrate that of the divine acts, okay, Remember, because we, we hold to an inseparability of, of operation. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit work together, not as a way like they all share the workload. It's the one divine act the Father, the Son, and the Spirit carry out, but the, the acts that we see in time and space produce creaturely effects. What do, I, what do I mean by creaturely effects? What we mean by that is that the Son taking on flesh that is a creaturely effect. What we see in time and space is part of creation, thus it is a creaturely effect. So when the when the dove, or sorry, when the when the spirit descends upon Jesus at the Transjordan in the form of a dove, that is a creaturely effect. When the Father declares, This is my son, okay, at the Trinit at the Jordan River, that spoken word that people hear is a creaturely effect. So in that 
in that motion, right, that, that one divine motion, we would say, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit together, right, they produce one act, but they manifest, they manifest distinctly and properly one on the Father, one on the Son, and one on the Spirit. So properly or distinctly. For example, it is the Son who was born of Mary, not the Father nor the Spirit. It is, it is the Spirit that took the form of a dove, not the Son nor the Father. And nor was it the same three that spoke from the heavens, stating, You are my Son at Jesus' baptism. Rather, it was the Father. Nevertheless, just as Father and Son and Holy Spirit are inseparable, so do they work inseparably. So I gave my kind of phrase or my explanation, then basically Augustine, uh, <clears throat> I quoted him directly to follow that. But if you've been watching all of these, you'll notice that I will explain something and forgetting that I have it already typed out afterwards. <laughs> so, sorry for the redundancy. Anyways, but I don't, well, I think it's important. I think that's a very, again, this is kind of a complex subject that takes, I think, redundancy in, in explaining what it means. As Augustine concludes... Hold on a second. As Augustine concludes, the inseparable operation of God is axiomatic to the Catholic faith. And I said Catholic, not Roman Catholic. It is an incontestable conclusion of the necessary consequence of the divine essence and attributes, attributes being identical. And we will see this fleshed out later by Augustine. But the short of it is that God is his essence and attributes, as divine and simplicity entails. And therefore, he is also his actions. However, the economia slash theologia framework, when overlooked or conflated, results in ontological and categorical errors. And Augustine must offer hermeneutical correction. Those who reject the full deity of the Son do so because they metaphysically stumble on the Incarnation. They understand, they understand and affirm that the divine essence is not subject to change, but they err in assuming the incarnation is a change and conclude that the Son cannot be immutable, be the immutable divine essence. They think that the Son transforms or changes into the, incarn the incarnate Son. Unfortunately, those who make this mistake, Augustine writes, have been confuted by the utterance of the clearest and most consistent divine testimonies. Quote, the Apostle John's words in the opening verse of his gospel, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Bringing in John 1.14, which is the Word became flesh, and John 1.3, all things were made through him, and without him was made nothing, into our discussion, Augustine offers a straightforward exegesis of these passages, concluding, in the Son's full divinity. His logic is sound when he writes, For every substance that is not God is a creature, and that is not a creature is God. And if the Son is not of the same substance as the Father, he is a made substance. If he is a made substance, then not all things were made through him. But all things were made through him. Therefore, he is of one and the same substance as the Father, and thus he is not only God, but also true God. So I would keep this phrase handy for when the Jehovah's Witnesses come knocking on your door. A few paragraphs later, Augustine substantiates his conclusion with other New Testament passages, like 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Romans 11, 33-36. He then brings the focus back to the inseparability of the three persons, emphasizing the divine operations in the one act of God manifested in the economia. Now, if you don't recall, I should explain earlier, but economia and theologia. So economia is a manner of reading scripture and understanding that there are passages that refer to the divine economy. So the divine economy is the divine act of Father, Son, and Spirit in the created order, in creation, the economy of God manifesting himself that we see, that we understand, that we can grasp in the creaturely world. The theologia framework, okay, these are kind of, we want to keep these together. There are passages that talk about God 
as he is in himself. So you can say economy and theology. Theology is the passages and the concepts that speak of God in himself, which we do not have as creatures access to penetrate, to see, to understand. We can we can grasp some things through what God has made through his word, but we can't but it's ultimately incomprehensible for us as creatures. So uh, as I was saying, um, he then brings the focus back to the inseparability of the three persons, emphasizing the divine operations in the one act of God manifested in the economia or the economy as as observed in the prepositional phrases of ek dia and eis of these passage from through in <clears throat> excuse me or from through to you would say actually augustine notes the utterance of the divine act in scripture shows distinct attribution of the effect to the divine persons from him, through him, and to him. We see those those phrases, those prepositional phrases, again, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, in Romans 11, 33 to 36. The common error is to see these prepositions in an instrumental form, whereby God the Father creates through the Son, with the Son as the Father's instrument of creation. And I, I believe that Jehovah's Witnesses would speak of the sun in this way. Like, they would say that God created the sun. He's his greatest creation. Again, they would cite, I think it's Revelation 3.14, right? And then that he is this instrument that creates everything else. Uh, and therefore, instrumentality implies a, quote, lesser than God status of the sun. However, as the telos of classical theism is the doxology of God, we see Paul's theology of the three orients to God's glory in the singular expression, to him be the glory forever and ever. We must therefore conclude, conclude that all three are the one God. How is God to receive glory if ultimately it is the Son as an instrument who does all the creating? If God's to get all the glory for everything, everything, and I mean everything, there can be no instrument that God uses. Otherwise, the instrument becomes the one that receives that glory because how then do we ultimately know that the instrument is not truly the creator? You see what I'm saying? So if if Jesus is the, is the creator ultimately and God creates through him, it creates this kind of division of now this there's a God behind God. There's this, there's this God that's now even more inaccessible that's unrelevatory because ultimately then he could say that he created the sun first and now the sun brings everything into creation and is now distinct from this eternal God. And so now we've got we got a problem here theologically, biblically, logically, everything. Now our Trinity doctrine goes away and now we have this kind of like demigod that somehow now um, has been revealed to us and that's where our worship's going to go. We're going to forget about the ultimate divine uh, God in himself, Father, Son, and Spirit. See, all three are going to lose out on that glory. Hold on a second. The testimony of the apostolic witness conflicts with Augustine's opponents who want to ascribe creation to the Father only. Now, them, again, his opponents have it kind of backwards than what we would have uh, in the Jehovah's Witnesses. Because, as Augustine identifies, how can all things be made through the Father, as Romans 11.36 intimates? Yet, as noted in John's Gospel, 1.3, all things were made through the Son. Augustine answers referring to the inseparable operations of the one God manifested in the trying persons of the economia. He writes, if some things were made through the Father, others through the Son, then it cannot be all things through the Father, nor all through the Son. But if it is all things through the Father and all through the Son, then it is the same things through the Father as through the Son. So, the Son is equal to the Father, and the work of the Father and Son is inseparable." End quote. 
Augustine attends to select passages that pose interpretive problems when it comes to affirming that Scripture teaches the Son is the same essence of the Father. Again, the key to consistent interpretation is maintaining the economia slash theologia distinction between, I'm sorry, when approaching the text. Augustine notes errors are made when one tries to transfer what is said of Christ Jesus, the man, to that substance of his, of his, which was everlasting before the incarnation and is everlasting still. Remember, the Son did not cease being the divine Son. Right? He still exists as Son, but he's taking on flesh that has a soul right? that is a person, that is human. So we would then say when Jesus Christ acts, and I've covered this, he acts in a manner that is proper to either the, the divine son or the human son. So when the person of Jesus eats food, that is the flesh that eats food. When the person of Jesus heals somebody and makes them whole, that is the divine son. But again, we, won't, we don't want to separate them in a sense and say they just kind of operate distinctly. Whatever the one does, it's fully a work of the Son. So this is how we can say that on the cross, God died. Or we can say Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah um, healed the leper. Right? We, would say, we can say those terms because the embodiment of the Son, the person of the Son, fully God, fully man, there is no admixture. Whatever the Son now does, we attribute to the person, but we ultimately know that the divine Son does not need to sleep, but the human Son needs to. So again, it is definitely a mystery, but we have a grammar, a language, a way of talking about these things in a manner that we can grasp. When it comes to the Father is greater than I passage, passages, especially in John 14, 28, the answer in the rule Augustine writes, where the distinction is clearly, clearly set out, is in Philippians 2, 6, which says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. The rule established from this passage is that the Son of God is God the Father's equal by nature, but now by, by condition, his inferior. In the form of a servant, which he took, he is the Father's inferior. The form of God, the word through whom all things were made. Okay, John 1, 3. In the form of God, he made man. In the form of a servant, he was made man. In the incarnation, the immutability of God is maintained in that neither of them, God, man, changed into the other by that takeover. Rather, Godhead changed into creature, sorry, not rather, excuse me, neither. Neither Godhead changed into creature in ceasing to be Godhead, nor creature changed into Godhead in ceasing to be creature, end quote. Augustine notes that when Christ told his disciples that he was going to the Father, who was greater than I, he did so because in his human form, they assumed he was inferior to the Father, Thus, their focus was aimed at his creatureliness, his adopted condition, not realizing he enjoys full equality with the Father. In the rest of Book 1, Augustine works through 1 Corinthians 15, 24-28, expounding other judgment texts along with it, uh, Matthew 25, 31, 32, John 5, all through there, John 8, and Revelations 1, 7. Arriving at a theologically consistent interpretation whereby he concludes that the reason for the Son taking on flesh and judging as the Son of Man with full authority from the Father is because the wicked cannot see the Son of God in his equality with the Father in the form of God. Those born again receive the Son of God as God in the form of man. The wicked do not. So in the form of man, all authority is given to him so that both good and bad may see him judging as son of man, the form in which he can see be seen by all, by some, however, to their undoing, by others to eternal life. That's an interesting point. That So he's saying that Jesus took on flesh for the purpose of judging so that those who are not born of the Spirit, who can only see with their eyes, 
not with their heart, can see the Son of Man, can see God bringing judgment to them. So pretty fascinating. All right, now we're going to move on to book two. So in book two, Augustine examines passages that refer strictly to the Son's being, his, his co-eternal equality from the Father. Such passages as John 10.30 and Philippians 2.6 indicate the equality and unity of substance between the Father and the Son. Augustine intends to bring precision to the discussion, whereby highlighting an important rule when interpreting Christological passages. Now, many have erred when it comes to the less than passages, John 14, 28, Philippians 2, 7, extracting from them the sense that the Son is inferior to the Father. Others look at passages judging the Son as is neither less nor equal to the Father, seeing that the Son is from the Father. If we follow such thinking, Augustine opines that it implies that in the Son taking on a creaturely form less than the Father, to which then we would have to conclude that it was the Father walking on water and performing healing miracles, which nobody, Augustine says, even out of his wits, could have such, excuse me, an idea, end quote. Now, I'm sorry, I haven't been using quote, end quote, throughout this uh, lecture, so um, if things sound like my words and his words, I do apologize for that. So how are we to interpret these passages about the Son in relation to the Father? Augustine says we are to conclude that the life of the Son is unchanging like the Father's and yet is from the Father. The works done can only be a work of God. Therefore, when Jesus says, Whatever the Father does, the Son, the same the Son does likewise. That's John 5.19. The likewise does not mean similar to or something he does after seeing the Father do it. Rather, quote, the working of the Father and the Son is equal and indivisible, and yet the Son's working comes from the Father. That is why the Son cannot do anything of himself except what he sees the Father doing, end quote. And from this understanding, we derive the rule when it comes to interpreting such passages, which purports to show, quote, not that the person is less than the other, but only that one is from the other, end quote. But more precisely, the rule affirmed is that the Son is not less than the Father, rather he is from the Father, quote, his birth in eternity, end quote. Now remember, we don't think of birth as we do from a creaturely perspective. Birth in eternity is intended to speak of the relationship between the Son and the Father. If a, if a woman gives birth, what does she give birth to? A child. So there's a relationship there. So we don't want to think of birth as the, the Son literally comes out of the Father. Now we would say the Son is in the bosom of the Father, but again, it's speaking of the relationship between the two. So we don't want to mix those up. So we say we, we, we're given language in Scripture to help understand when the, the Son from the Father means it can't be a time when the Son was not and then the Father produced him like a creature. Otherwise, Christ is merely a created entity. So Augustine's rule reflects the economia theologia interpretive approach, or as, as he refers to it, the form of a servant rule and the form of God rule. Properly applied to the text, we then understand John 7, 16, which says, My teaching isn't mine, but is from the one who sent me. End quote. So, we then understand that the Son and the teaching are simply the Son's life and the Son's teaching. And the same goes for the Spirit. Augustine writes, He has what is the Son's because he takes what is the Son's and declares it. And the Son has everything of the Father. No creature can take what is the Father's. And that was in quotes. That was just... Uh, Augustine didn't write that. Anyways. Further grounding his ontological understanding of the Spirit in the Divine Essence, Augustine takes John 15.26 as parallel with John 5.19, whereby he reasons that both the Son and the Spirit are from the Father, but neither of neither are of ontological inferior, inferiority to the Father. Augustine's statement reveals a quote pro Nicene picture of the Son and the Spirit as a de as dependent on the Father end quote, and that is from 
Lewis Ayers, who has a great book called Augustine and the Trinity. To further strengthen his argument for the ontological equality of the Son and the Spirit with the Father, Augustine observes that the Spirit and the Father are said to both glorify the Son. We see this in John 16, 14 and 17, 5. And so he offers a concession. Granted, the one who glorifies is greater than the one he glorifies. But, quote, let them at least grant that those who glorify each other are equal, end quote. In chapter 2, again still in this book, Augustine begins by refuting an Homoian objection. H-O-M-O-I-A-N. Homoian objection. Which is what? The one who sends is greater than the one sent. Again, Jehovah's Witnesses do the same thing. So he dabbles in it a bit now, but he will expound further in Book 4 on missions as God's revealing in time the processions of the persons. The Homoian objection is bereft of logic. Why is that? The Son and Spirit are already in this world. So why is the sender greater than the sent considering where he, the Son and or the Spirit, was sent to is where he already was? Augustine asks, if both and if both Son and Spirit are already in the world, what then does it mean to say the Father, who is never never said to have been sent, sends the Son or the Spirit? Augustine concludes from Galatians 4:4 4, 4, that God sending His Son, it was quote in being made of woman that the Son was sent. End quote. Augustine reminds us that the Father and the Son have one. Oops have one will and operate indivisibly, so every divine work manifested in time is one work of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But this point presents another possible challenge Augustine wants to address. According to the preceding statement, one could say that the Son sent himself. How then could the Father have sent him if the Son sent himself? In response, Augustine asked, quote, In what manner did God send his Son? An order? A command? Well, whatever way it was done, it was certainly done by word. End quote. Now, the following uh, few slides here is an elaboration of what Augustine means and what he means, and it needs to be quoted in full because there's a lot to go through. So he writes, But God's word is his son. So when the Father sent him by word, what happened was that he was sent by the Father and his word. Hence it is by the Father and the Son that the Son was sent, because the Son is the Father's word. Okay, the Son is in the Father. The Son is the Father's word. Would anyone adopt so blasphemous opinion as to suppose that it was by a word in time that the Father sent the Eternal Son to appear in the course of time in the flesh? That would make sense. Though it is true that in the word of God, which was in the beginning with God and was God, that is to say, in the wisdom of God, there was timelessly contained the time in which that wisdom was to appear in the flesh. So while without any beginning of time, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, without any time there was in the word the time at which the word would become flesh and dwell among us. And when his fullness of time came, God sent his son made of woman, that is, made in time, in order that the word might be shown to men incarnate. And the time at which this should happen was timelessly contained within the word. The whole series of all times timelessly contained in God's eternal wisdom. Since then, it was a work of the Father and the Son that the Son should appear in the flesh, the one who is so appeared in the flesh is appropriately said to have been sent in the one who did not to have done the sending. It's a pretty uh, intense statement. The inseparable divine act of the Father and the Son, the Eternal Father speaking his eternal word, not by command, but, but by the one will of God, with the word as the wisdom of God, the word was sent in the fullness of time to be made manifest among men. So I recommend maybe going back and listening to that again uh, to kind of grasp that because there is a lot to that. 
Augustine makes an important distinction, giving the proper nuance regarding the Father sending the Son. The invisible Father sent the invisible Son, who was made visible. Augustine writes that if the Son's substance changed into something visible, then we could think of the Son as simply being sent by the Father, quote, and not also as sending with the Father, end quote. The distinction retains the inseparability of the divine persons with the manifesting of the invisible Son in the human form of Jesus as the outward sign of the divine act. And likewise, with the Spirit, his action in Acts 2-2 as the tongues of fire, Augustine writes, visibly expressed and presented to mortal eyes is called the sending of the Holy Spirit. So again, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in the divine will decreed to send the Son in that sending from the Word, decided by the Word, was manifested okay, in time and space in the creation of Jesus Christ, of the Messiah in the flesh. So that sending of the Son shows us the relationship of the Father to the Son. In the sending of the Spirit, in time, that manifests, right, the created effect, the tongues of fire, right, is the visible expression of the Holy Spirit, of His relation to the Father and the Son, that we can see with mortal eyes. So, but that wraps up our first lecture. Um, again, some probably pretty, pretty weighty things to go through. Um, I think as I go through the later lectures, oh, sorry, the later books in our next lecture, it should kind of really kind of get in, get in more. And I would recommend going to um, some of the other lectures I did on the Cappadocians where we talk about um, the inseparable operations. And that's become a, a big topic in certain circles today and in, in the academic world, but also in the Twitterverse and social media verse and even kind of in certain camps. So but anyways, again, Augustine, a fabulous, fabulous thinker. Um, I'm just touching on just a part of, of what he's gone through. And again, I'll be finishing up the rest of uh, the sections up through seven or eight in his work on the Trinity. And then we'll be done with Augustine. All right. I will see you when? I'll see you next time.